In this series, we're, we're talking about the miraculous transformations that happen, happens in us when we're born again, and, and a lot of our insight for this comes from the writings of the Apostle Paul. Here in Colossians 1.25, he says, God called me to present to you the Word of God in its fullness, uh, the mystery that has been kept hidden from ages and generations, for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that right there is the most powerful reality knowable to humans. Christ in you. It's through Paul's letters that we not only see who Jesus is to us, who, but who we are to him and what it means to have him living in us. Paul is a guy who really fleshes out the gospel, who, who gives us a behind-the-scenes picture of what Jesus did and who he is in us. Paul would argue that Christianity is not a religion as much as a new reality. It's a supernatural way of relating to our creator and to life, and the only way we can experience this is by revelation. Now, this morning, I would really encourage you to follow along in your outline because we're going to cover sort of a quantum uh, area, I mean, a picture of this whole thing, the big picture. And uh, we're putting together a lot of things that we've talked about in the pre previous weeks. And if you're a beginner, uh, I, I believe the Holy Spirit's going to take little elements of this and, and, and help you with it. If you've been tracking with me, this is really going to start to come together for you, all right? And that's what we're praying for this morning. In fact, I want you to see how Paul says this very thing about Revelation uh, here in 1 Corinthians 2.9. He says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us. And how? Read it with me. By his Spirit. It's only as the Holy Spirit illumines the Word and draws us in that we can see and know this kingdom Jesus came to establish. Jesus told Peter, he said, flesh and blood cannot reveal this to you. This has to come from the Holy Spirit. But here's the wonderful thing. The Holy Spirit is living in the spirit of every believing Christian to do that very thing. He wants to reveal this to us. He's there to reveal this to us. He's not holding out. He's simply waiting for us to pursue him for the revelation. Now, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, to me, the most clearly defines why he waits. All right? Look at this. Isaiah 30, 18 says, The Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Now, that's not because God really likes to watch us beg. That's not, he's not holding out on us. He values and enjoys the relationship. And he knows if he just dumped this stuff on us without us ever asking for it, we never ask. We never talk to him. So the Lord waits to be gracious, and he waits till we cry out. And so let's do that right now. Lord, in Jesus' name, we come to you, and we ask, we cry out for revelation. We cry out for this thing that we are uh, incapable of seeing without your illumination. Would you awaken our hearts this morning? Would you blow through all the stuff that is distracting us and, and, and clouding our minds and keeping us from seeing these realities, these truths of who we have become in Christ? Awaken our hearts, Lord. Touch us this morning. Speak to us. Open the eyes of our understanding. Open our ears to hear what your spirit is saying. Give me utterance to speak your word today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You know, the amazing thing about, you know, Paul's writings is how just a little bit of this stuff, of revelation on what Paul saw, just opens up whole new vistas of experience with God. When I was in my 20s, I got started on this journey, and I just saw a sliver of what Paul uh, saw about us being set free from the power of sin, and it rocked my world. I mean, it rocked a lot of our world. Uh, I, I still run into people who 
tell me, you know, they're walking in the light that God gave them in those early years. But as I shared with you last week, these things stay clear only if we're holding them up to God, you know, only if we're asking for illumination. David said in Psalm 36, it's in your light that we see light. It's only when you're illumining these truths that, that our hearts wake up that we see what you see. So here's the first passage that really came online for me, that God just illumined for me back in, in early 70s, mid-70s, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we'll start reading here in verse 11. Paul says, if what is passing away, and he, he's referring to the old covenant, God's relationship with the nation of Israel, it's founded on the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, he says, if that was glorious, what remains? If the stuff that was passing away is glorious, if, what remains? The new covenant, our relationship with God and, have, and, and, and his laws written on our hearts, this is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we are very bold. Because verse 17, look at this. He says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, that's what we're going to break down. We're going to unpack all of those the little pieces to this uh, today. I call this the beholding becoming principle. It's the truth that says whatever we behold in God's heart toward us, we become. The more I read about his love and his mercy and his goodness, the more it transforms my heart and takes me that direction. It's another way to say it. Whatever I see in God's heart toward me awakens in my heart toward God. When I see his love for me, it awakens my love for him. I become what I behold. John said, we love because he loved us. We, it awakens love in our hearts. Now, before we get into this, let me define the word glory, because that's the statement, uh, that's the word Paul uses here. The glory of God in this instance is a reference to God's infinite beauty and greatness, his perfection, the, the perfection of his character and splendor of his worth. It's the magnitude of his immeasurable power. All the attributes of God are brilliant beyond description. In fact, we need the whole Bible to get a, a, a full picture of just how other than us God really is. And especially we need to see him in the face of Jesus as he's revealed in Jesus. Hebrews 1, 3 says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature. Paul's saying here that what we have in Christ is so much greater than what the Old Testament uh, believers experience. This new covenant relationship just gives us enormous confidence before God. It emboldens us to be everything we see in the pages of Scripture, in the pages of the New Testament with conviction. He said, I admit, you know, what Moses had, what David and Elijah and the prophets had, that was glorious. But guys, you... Well, what, what you have now in Jesus is light years beyond that. It's light years more glorious. And since it's so important for us to, you know, know what that means, let's, let's think about that for a little bit. Let's just, let's just imagine that we've got some of the greatest men of the Old Testament up here on the platform. We're going to do a little panel discussion, and these guys are the major Hall of Fame superstars. You know, I mean, they're the faith giants. And as moderator, I say to you all, let's tell these guys, let's tell these gentlemen on a on stage why the glory of what Jesus did on the cross makes what they had look like a birthday candle compared to a blazing sun. You know, let's just, let's, let's talk about the difference. So one of you stands up and says, well, it seems pretty obvious to me. I mean, the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant is that we got total forgiveness of sins by the blood of Jesus and the love of God. I mean, that is way more glory. David's got his hand up, you know. <laughs> he says, forgiveness? Did you forget about me? I committed adultery and then murdered a woman's husband. But that was totally forgiven. And I was blown away by how much the, the revelation of how much God loves me. I mean, it's all through my Psalms. I mean, you read them, right? And David sits down. And it's true, the blood of Jesus does secure our forgiveness. I mean, that's glorious, but the Old Testament 
believers, you know, they could draw on that love and they could experience that forgiveness in their day too. So that can't be the answer. Another you stands up and says, well, uh, they're all the miracles Jesus did. I mean, come on. He healed all kinds of sick people and raised the dead and stopped storms and fed 5,000 people, little boys lunch. It's got to be the miracle. Moses pops up and says, I got this one. Miracles? <laughs> Want to talk miracles? I witnessed the Red Sea part down the middle. Watch three million people cross it on dry ground. Like that, that, That's the whole St. Louis metro area. Every day for 40 years, we ate food that came out of the sky. We drank water that gushed out of a desert rock. Nobody needed a doctor. A cloud protected us from the relentless desert sun. Uh, uh, our shoes didn't wear out. A pillar of fire kept us warm at night. Trust me, we saw plenty of miracles. And yeah, God did some spectacular miracles in the Old Testament, so it can't be miracles. And somebody says, well, I, I think it's that thing that happened on the day of Pentecost. You know, the Holy Spirit came on 120 people, and they spoke in new languages, and flames of fire were sitting on their heads. Bible scholars call that the manifest glory of God, where he makes his glory visible. Elijah says, this one's mine. <laughs> I stood before 850 false prophets of Baal, false god you know, the, the, the national religion at the time was to this, this evil thing. And he said, I proved Israel's God was greater by calling down holy fire to consume a sacrifice that I had laid out. And let me just describe that for you. It was sitting on a stone altar piled high with wood, and I soaked the whole thing in water until it filled a trench that I dug, dug around the thing. And the fire was so intense, it burned up the bull, the wood, the stones, the dust, and even licked up the water in the ditch. Yeah, I'd say we saw the glory of God in our day. Solomon goes, same thing happened when we dedicated the temple. Fire fell from heaven, burned up the offerings. The presence of God was so powerful, the priest couldn't stand to minister. Okay, so we're batting out here. I mean, we're striking out. We, we, we know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It can't be forgiveness or knowing God's love. It's not miracles. It's not displays of his glory. I mean, those are certainly benefits of the New Covenant, but... They were also available in the Old Covenant. Now, if Paul were here, I think he'd say, take another look at verse 17. Your answer's right here. Where, let's read it together. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The difference in the covenants is that now the Holy Spirit lives inside us liberating our hearts. Moses, David, Elijah, none of the Old Testament guys had the internal transforming power of God living in them. And then there's this in Hebrews 10, 16, quoting, from, uh, quoting what God said 600 years earlier through the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. So this is a quote from Jeremiah in the New Testament. He said, this is the new covenant I will make. And here it is. God spells it out. I'll put my word into their hearts and I'll write, my, I'll write it in their minds. The huge difference between the covenants is this Holy Spirit dimension, this whole new life dimension where he's transforming us from the inside out. God promised to actually change our hearts by empowering our emotions to desire what he desires for us. righteousness, that, that my heart would actually want righteousness, because that is not where my heart naturally goes. My heart naturally goes with sin. They, but he said, I'm going to change that. I'm going to live in you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to empower your emotions to desire what I desire and, and to love what I love. I'll change your mind. I'll write my word into your thinking, meaning God's promise is to enlighten us so we can actually understand and enjoy the Bible. Because <laughs> I know some of you are thinking, enjoy the Bible. Now, that would be interesting. Because I started the same place. I thought, ah, oh, it's time to read the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is, you know, this is what the Holy Spirit is in us to do. Now, verse 12. So we got to get to where figure out how to get this happening, all right? Verse 12, therefore, we've got the kind of hope that makes us bold. This kind of hope is not wishful thinking. This is truth anchored in the word of God that Jesus promised would never pass away, 
eternal fixed reality, we can be confident that this promise of internal transformation is real. It's true. That the way God feels about us is unconditional, unchanging. We can actually experience God's Spirit moving in us and through us and changing us. Look at verse 17 again. The Holy Spirit's presence brings liberty at the heart level, meaning our emotions can change. Paul's saying you can get liberated from feeling condemned all the time. You can break free from fear. I know some of you deal with panic like I have in the, in the past. You can get free of that. You can get free of resentment. Every dark emotion that plagues the human heart because of this new dynamic that's working in you. There is freedom. Listen to this. Where the Holy Spirit is recognized and welcome where we interact with him and value our relationship with him, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the, read this with me, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now that means this friendship with God's Spirit within us is just as tangible, just as real as the grace of Jesus and the love of God. So obviously, we got to figure this out. We want to get to know this person. We want to understand what it means to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And that's where the trust pairs have been so helpful to us. They help us develop the verbal skills for addressing and acknowledging acknowledging him as the person Jesus describes him to be. In fact, I would say these trust prayers have, have been the chief agent for change in my life over these last few years. They've helped me connect to, to just lock into the Spirit's indwelling presence, to learn to rely on him for understanding. Uh, I mean, we say all these things, but this is, these are actually the tools for, for making the connection. They've helped me to trust him to use me, to strengthen me, to resist temptation. He's always been there, you know, to help me love what's right and see what's wrong. But these tools have actually uh, in, in empowered me to draw from him, draw on him for that, to break the power of greed or selfishness or lust or whatever's got a hold on my, my mind or heart. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Friends, liberty is within your reach. If you're a born-again believer, it is within your reach because the Holy Spirit is living inside you. Jesus promised he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is there to make liberty happen inside you. Liberty and being transformed into the image of Christ is our inheritance. We can be changed. This is the glory of the new covenant. It's not that, you know, we're just going to, muddle through life, just gutting it out and, you know, wishing we could feel different or be different inside. Inner transformation can happen now because of this person that's living in it. And I know some of you just want to defy that and say, you just don't know what a mess I am. I mean, you just don't, uh, I blow it so much, I am convinced God's going to give up on me before I get there. That is absolutely not true. That is absolutely, the Bible says we can be confident in the way God sees us and feels about us. All the way through the process, in, in the middle of all of our messes. Let me read you a verse that's been incredibly meaningful to me for decades. This one was, uh, we learned it in a song years and years ago. Lamentations 3, 28, or 22. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. I love this part. They are new. Every morning, great is your faithfulness. You know, that's one of those verses I quote all the time because that means I, every day I get a new slate. I get a clean slate. I get a completely new shot at getting this right. The Holy Spirit says, all right, Easter egg hunt. I have hidden new mercies all over your day. And I'm going to help you find them, all right? I mean, I didn't hide them behind anything. They're laying out in the grass. We're just going to find this together, all right? I got new mercies waiting for you, boy. It's what Jonah 2, 8 says. It's talking about it. He says, those who worship worthless idols are, are lying vanity. Some translations say for, forfeit the mercy that could be theirs. We don't want to miss the new mercies God has waiting for us, getting sidetracked, being entertained, getting, you know, 
uh, having our stuff absorb our, our thoughts and our life. We, we, he's put all this stuff around us be, uh, that he wants us to find, these mercies that he's wanting us to find because, and, and in us because we're in Christ. He's put all this grace in us. Okay, so back to 2 Corinthians 3. Paul says, you want liberty? Here it is. Here's how you experience it. Verse 18, we all, doesn't matter, matter how bad we were, we are or ever will be. Doesn't matter what kind of personality or temperament we got. Doesn't matter whether we're an extrovert or introvert. We all inherit this ability in Christ. We all, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. That's what's being offered every single New Testament believer. We can be transformed into the same image of Christ we're beholding from glory to glory. So it's a progressive experience. We encounter the liberty of the new covenant by beholding as in a mirror. And that phrase, as in a mirror, is a critical part of how we behold the glory. Several years earlier in his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul defined what he meant by a mirror. It's here in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. He says, now we, now we see in a mirror dimly, but in the age to come, we will see face to face. We will know as we're known, the Bible tells us. In the ancient world, a mirror was very different than the mirror we have today. I mean, in our mirror, what you see is what you got. I mean, you, whew, every wrinkle, mole, pimple, it's like, when did that happen? Paul's day, a mirror was just a piece of polished metal. So it was a very dim reflection, meaning you, when you looked in a mirror, you still weren't sure whether your part was straight or if your lunch was stuck in your teeth. You know, it was an ancient mirror gave you a very dim idea of what was going on. But think about this. That's really good news, especially in what he's saying here, because that means if you want to experience more of the transforming power, the liberty the Holy Spirit is in you to bring, Paul says you can behold his glory even in a dim way, and it'll still affect you. It'll still impact you. It doesn't have to, to be a blinding light on the road to Damascus. It doesn't have to be, you know, some major encounter. You know, oh, I was with the Holy Spirit this morning. He shook me, and I was, and all the junk came out of me. No, no. It doesn't have to be that clear. It can even a blurry reflection is enough if you stay with it. All right. So let me ask you this: not a trick question. When you look in a mirror, who do you see? Yeah, yourself. You see yourself. So Paul's talking about us looking in a mirror and seeing a dim reflection of the new man or new woman we become in Christ. Wouldn't you say that's an accurate assessment? He's talking about a reflection of what's happened in, in our recreated, born-again spirits where the Holy Spirit is living. So what mirror would he be referring to? I mean, there's only one mirror there's only one physical thing we have that is a reflection of the new creation. What would that be? Your Bible. Yeah. This new covenant, particularly. That, that is the mirror of God's Word. The glory of God in us is the new creation. That's really what Paul's talking, referring to. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's what that first verse we read. It's the Holy Spirit living in your born-again spirit. This making sense? Paul says, even a dim reflection of that reality, even a Roman mirror reflection of that reality will transform you, will go a long way in changing the way you feel, the way you think, the way you act. It's as we gaze intently at this new reality in the pages of Scripture, these verses that reflect this new creation inside us, that we actually start to experience this stuff, especially when the Holy Spirit illumines it. We start to look and act like the Sermon on the Mount Christians, Jesus recreated us and called us to be. Remember when we were going through this, and I told you, I said, this is going to sting. This is going to be gnarly. You're going to be squirming as you sit here and listening to all this stuff, but, but just stay with it because this is who you are. 
This is what, you know, and, and I, many of you shared the same kind of experience that I had. I mean, we were reading what Jesus said, God's intent with the law, and it was like, oh, dear God, I'm blowing it on Malta. You know, I thought I was blowing it a little. I'm blowing it in a major way. It's, it's like, oh, my goodness. But on the inside, every one of us was going, yes, this is who I am. This is what I was designed to be. Paul says, instead of being conformed to the world, he said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get the truth out there, even if it's painful, even if it hurts your eyes at first. Your eyes will adjust. You'll love the light a lot better than you love the dark. Let, let your eyes adjust. Start looking in this mirror, letting the light of who you've become in Christ begin to affect you because what you see is what you will become. This is who you are. This is what's happened in your recreated spirit. This is the life of God that's in you. This is where he wants to take you. And that's why you want to be in church. That's, the, you know, that, that's why you want to be sitting here and letting the light you know, hit your eyes. And the, the, the goal is to experience the reality of this new covenant, the, who we become in Christ. In Philemon uh, 1, 6, Paul's praying here that the sharing of your faith may become effectual. And look at, look at how he says that happens. Read it with me. By acknowledging every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So it's seeing this new reality that generates the faith to receive and experience it. The idea is you don't want to just look at this occasionally. You want to make spending time in front of God's mirror as much a habit as you do looking in natural mirrors, bathroom mirrors. I'm really big on that. You know, I, I looked in one right before I walked out here. Because I want to know, you know, what you're seeing. That, you know, all my buttons and zippers are fastened. And, you know, and that my hair isn't standing straight up. And ja Listen to this. Listen to this verse. James 1.23 says, Anyone who listens to the word but not, does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now, isn't that interesting? He uses the same analogy. He's saying the reason we don't look and behave more like Jesus is more of a sight problem than anything else. Because what we see is what we experience. The problem for most of us, we've seen parts of this, and it transformed us for a time, and then we went to sleep, and we lost it, and we forgot what we look like. We forgot who we are. So you know what I'm doing here? I'm waking you up. I'm saying, remember who you are. Look at who you are. This is who you are. This is who you were designed to be. This is who you have living in you. The spirit of liberty is in you to make you, to transform you, to, to awaken God desires in you. That's why we take these truths. We want to get them in our dialogue with God. Remember me saying, if we could see what Paul saw, we could live like Paul lived? There's no question. I mean, this guy lived a supernatural lifestyle, but it was because of what he was looking at. Peter walked on water when he could see, when he was looking at Jesus. <laughs> That's the power of this reality. When you're seeing this by the illumination of the Holy Spirit, this has transforming power. You say, oh, you just don't know me. Yes, I do know you. I know who you are in Christ. You're saying, do I know about all your failures? I don't need to know about your failures. I have plenty of my own. You know, I need to, we need to see each other and help each other and prod each other to see what the Bible says about us, what Jesus sees when he looks at us. We're wanting to see what Paul saw so we can live like Paul lived. Talk about unbelievable life. I mean, the guy went through hardship that we can't even imagine. He was tortured for his faith but he calls it momentary light affliction. <laughs> Basically nothing compared to the joy of knowing Christ. In fact, at one point, they stone him to death. When his executioners leave his lifeless body laying there, he gets a jolt of resurrection life, stands up, walks back into town to preach some more. I want to know Jesus the way Paul knew, knew Jesus. I don't want his assignment. Which really troubles me because sometimes I think the assignment goes along with some, <laughs> some of the glory of what the Lord showed him. So 
we behold the glory of the Lord in us by reading, meditating on scriptures, like the ones in the bulletin last weekend, because those verses are our new reflection. Let me tell you the value of getting some of these things memorized. In the middle of the night when my brain, you know, starts to race and the devil's telling me this is it, this is the big one, you're going to die. Those words that I've memorized act like a fire hydrant hose. I mean, they just just put out those lies that are coming against my mind. Paul uses the analogy of a shield in Ephesians 6.16. He says, take up the shield of faith which, which, with which you will be able to extinguish how many? All. All the fiery darts of the wicked one. All. It means there's nothing the devil can lie to you about that the truth of God's word won't extinguish and shield you from. But you have to use the shield. <laughs> you have to speak the words. So two verses that I, I'm hold, holding on to right now that are really helping me. Colossians 3.15 and Ephesians 4.7. And I just simplify these. I personalize them and say them like this. The peace of Jesus rules my heart, which is, encompasses my mind. And the peace of Jesus guards my heart. And I say those kind of back to back. The peace of Jesus rules my mind. The peace of Jesus guards my heart. And I just really slow it down and let those words just settle in my soul. And it is uncanny how the attacks will back off, will, will, will either stop or back off. It's still right there, but there's a bubble that's bigger than me that I'm in now that's just buffering me. I just keep saying, thank you, Jesus. Your peace, you gave me your peace. Your peace is in me. Your peace rules me. Your peace that passes all my understanding, it rules my mind. It guards my heart. It protects me. The experience of that reality accompanies me speaking those words to the Holy Spirit. Now, occasionally... I'll hear the Holy Spirit. I'll sense the Holy Spirit saying, I, you need to address this. This is an entity, a demon that's tormenting you. Tell him to get out of here in Jesus' name. Now, I want to say, you tell him. <laughs> you, you tell him, Holy Spirit. And the Spirit says, no, no. Jesus gave you the name. You tell him. You tell him. I want you to know this. I already know he'll leave. You, you tell him. I want you to know he'll leave because you tell him. And it has amazed me. Look at that, Holy Spirit. High five. I mean, that worked. Look at that. I mean, he left me. See, now, once I get some traction on this, as I'm, you know, I'm just speaking these words, once I get, I can even say I'm just in my mind. And, I, you know, I start actually building myself up. I'm on a roll. You know, I'm getting energized. There is a dimension of power within us that we seldom tap. There is, there is power, there is life in us that I would say the vast majority of us here seldom tap. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying, you've got to get in touch with this, guys. The days ahead are not going to be possible if you don't get in touch with this. You're, you're not going to be able to stand up to what's coming if you're not in touch with this life, this reality that is in you. I'll teach you how. I'll take you by the hand. I'm not doing this without your involvement. I'm not going to I'm not going to pull this off without you. I want you, you need to take these verses, memorize these verses, get these verses in your head and your heart start saying. All right, so let's just read a, a few more here uh, today. Let, let's read the reference first. All right, there it is at the bottom. Romans 5:17. Read it with me. Come on. I have received the gift of righteousness and I will reign as a king in life by Jesus Christ. Now, here's what stops. Here, here, here it is. Here's the big roadblock. Yeah, you righteous. Ah! Don't look at your experience. In fact, stop looking at you altogether. Look at who Jesus is in you. Look at who the Holy Spirit is in you. That's what we're talking about. Stop looking at you. Paul says, I put no confidence in myself. I don't look at myself. I don't even evaluate myself. I look at who Christ has made me. I look at the new creation. I look at the life of God. Okay, so let's read it one more time. I have received the gift of righteousness, 
and I will reign as a king in life by Jesus Christ. All right, here's a couple more. Uh, Romans, go with me on the verse. Romans 6, 11. I am dead to sin and alive to God. And I hear the devil. Yeah, you, right. You're dead to sin. Well, what were you doing this afternoon? You know, what do you call that? What do you call this? What do you call that? You know, what you said, what you did, what you wanted to do to that guy who pulled in front of you. You know, <laughs> I am dead to sin. And alive to God. I just keep saying it. I am dead to sin. Now, you know, when Paul says this, he says, give account of this fact. Account for it. Say it. That verse got me through my 20s without a major moral meltdown. And a lot of young guys that I was hanging out with. I mean, there is power in them, their words. Those are true. That is reality. That is who you are. You are dead to sin. You are alive to God. You got to quit looking at your experience. You got to start looking at who God's, what God says, all right? Ephesians, keep going. Ephesians 1, 3. Let's read it. I am blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We don't have time for, to unpack that one, but man, oh man. Ephesians 1, 17. Let's read this one. I have received the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. The eyes of my understanding are being enlightened. All right, one time Moses is talking to the Lord, and he asked him to see his glory. It's in Exodus 33, 18. In fact, he says, please show me your glory. And God said, okay, I will. I'll show you my glory, but here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to show you my name. I'm going sh- to let you see what I'm like. I'm going to show you my personality because when you recognize and relate to me as I truly am, my glory will start to touch your life in a way that it hasn't. Verse 19, God said, I'll make all my goodness pass before you, and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. And in Exodus 34, 6, the Lord, as he's passing before Moses, says, proclaims his name. He says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. Now, it's interesting that Paul's quoting from Exodus 33 and 34 in 2 Corinthians 3, this passage we spent the last half hour looking at. So beholding the glory is about relating to God according to the truth of who God says he is, how he feels about Because a lot of folks, you know, see God very differently than God just described himself. They see him as an angry judge who's distant, demanding, disapproving, a disciplinarian. God picks words to describe himself, and they're all relational. Do you notice that? Words like merciful, gracious, patient, good, truthful. God is merciful. Look at this. Micah 7, 18 says, who is, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity? Because he delights in mercy. He, he's tender with you in weakness. So when you relate to God believing in his tenderness, you're beholding his glory. I, I, I wish I had time with that one. He delights in being merciful. He loves to show you mercy. That's amazing. And don't forget, we're beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, meaning we're looking at Christ in us, who is the radiance of God's glory, which means as we meditate on what the Word tells us about Jesus and about God, the Holy Spirit is transforming us into that image, into being merciful and gracious and patient and good and truthful expressions of himself. God is gracious, Psalm 103. Verse 10 says, he doesn't punish us for our sins. He, he doesn't deal harshly with us as we deserve. He knows how weak we are. He remembers that we're only dust. That's why he doesn't hit us with lightning bolts when we blow it. You know, he gives us, he gives us grace instead of what we deserve. We get us such a good deal. But that's also who he is in us. This is how he wants to love through us, graciously, believing the best about people, forgiving, praying for him, blessing them. God is good. Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good, not for disaster. Give you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 32, 40, he says, I'll make them an everlasting covenant. I will not turn away from doing good to them. I will rejoice in doing them good. I will bring upon them all the good that I promised them. God makes it very clear. His heart's desire is to show goodness toward us, both now and forever. But that's also who he is in us. 
in our spirit, the more we behold the new creation, the mirror of the word, the more we'll express that goodness to the people around us. Now, Paul has one more thing. All right, hold on for one more little piece of truth here. One more important thing in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that he says to us. We're being transformed into the same image as we're beholding, but notice how it happened. It's from what? Say it. Glory to glory. In other words, it's progressive. And since we're imperfect, finite humans, progress typically comes two steps forward, one step back, right? That's about the way it works. It's like, oh, I'm really, oh, man, I fouled up. Spiritual transformation is a process. It's slow. It's incremental. And the change is only really noticeable when you look back over time. And we're talking a lot of time, a lifetime of time. Here's what it's like. You know, you decide, okay, that's it. I'm done with food. I am eating healthy starting today. I am getting in shape. You know, I am working out. So you, day one, man, you sweat. You eat veggies. You don't even, you don't even look at a milkshake. You just, day two, you jump on the scale, and somehow you've gained two pounds. <laughs> it's so unfair. It is so unfair. We want magical transformation. Out of shape one day, buff the next, right? That's it. But it doesn't work that way. I wish there was a pill. The magazines say there's a pill. After years of junk food and, ex and, and no exercise, I mean, it takes a while before you start to see visible results. It takes, this, it's the same with the Spirit. This happens over time, but it's little by little. And why the, it's why Zechariah 4.10 says, do not despise these small beginnings. On day two, we think, what's the use? Never going to happen. You know, part of the problem is the American culture. They dangle this dramatic, extreme carrot of, you know, change. And uh, I get Men's Health magazine. I'll tell you, there every issue. There is not a single guy in, these ma in this magazine that does not have chiseled abs. <laughs> that is not just a... Steve McKinney calls them genetic marvels. I mean, every, every guy <laughs> in this magazine is a genetic marvel. And the magazine promises me if I will do this, look, watch him do this. If you will do this, you will look just like him. That is a lie. That is a lie. Can I have an amen? amen. That is a lie. I don't care how many ab crunches you do, you know. So sick of hearing about my core, you know. <laughs> Sheesh. Here you women, you know, you deal with the same thing. It creates this impossible expectation for what we should do and what we should be. So we despise small beginnings. We want quantum leap makeovers. I mean, take me into surgery and suck this stuff out of me. <laughs> when I decide to make some changes to get healthy, you know, I had to tell myself, I just want to live longer and feel a little better doing it. That's it. That's, that's all I'm going for. And then, over a long period of time, I started to see some results. And then I set bigger goals. We despise delayed gratification in this country. It's, it's why we can't sustain anything long term. I want drive through. I want the drive through version, you know, of everything. And I don't want a line in my drive through. <laughs> I'll watch all the fast food restaurants to see which one doesn't have a line. No, I don't want a McDonald's, but they don't have a line. I'm going. <laughs> you know, this is our problem. Isn't this our problem? Paul knows. He knows what's going to happen. He knows you're going to want to give up on this before you even get started. And so he writes this to give us confidence in this. Stay with it. Keep eating your veggies. Keep taking a walk after dinner. You, you know, well, I've been doing it three months. I still don't look or feel any better. Stay with it. Three years from now, say, tell me how you're feeling. The same is true in the Spirit. All right, I, I promised you I was bring this together. Here it is. Uninspired, dull, boring Bible reading. Uninspired, dull prayer. Works. 
It really works. Yeah, it's dim beholding, but that's all God requires. A dim beholding will still transform you. A dim beholding will still change you. You can do this. This is, God didn't put this up there for the Pauls and the, you know, the guys that just, you know, chisel abs and, and Mr. Olympia. This is down there on the bottom shelf, guys. This is for everybody. All of us can be transformed. All of us can experience liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. If you are born again, the spirit of liberty lives in you. Let God write the glory of this new covenant. Let him write the glory of the new covenant on your heart and mind. Let him begin to transform you this week. Well, you probably will come back next week and go, I don't feel any different. Yeah, but you're getting different. You're, turning, you're being transformed. You just haven't seen it yet. You got a lot of layers of fat to burn off before you're going to feel any different. I'm sorry. <laughs> there are things happening under all that <laughs> that don't minimize. Don't minimize. You, you, do you hear what I'm saying? You're going to blow it this week. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to want to toss in a towel. Don't toss in a towel. Let's, let's take these verses. Let's, let's take these verses this week. Let's say, God, I'm going to say these to you. I'm going to pray these to you. Let's take, get back up. Some of you have fallen off the wagon on the trust and fellowship prayers. Do it again. Get back on the horse. Say, I'm going to say these prayers to you, even if they feel like they are doing nothing for me. I'm going to keep saying because dim beholding works. It will liberate my soul. It will change my heart. Stand with me, let's pray. Lord, you are in this place today to help us. I, I sense your presence illumining these things. There's, there's illumination happening. Don't let us walk out of here and have this stuff close up on us. I'm asking you for illumination. Now, I, I, I said that and I, immediately. This is what I... I heard in my heart, you're going to have to say this to each other. You know that, right? If you're not talking this with somebody, if you're not speaking these words, these things will close on you. That's why I talk to you about take those discussion questions, ask somebody, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are you sensing about this? Where are you at on these things? You got to have it, guys. You got to have it. This is real. This stuff we're talking about is real. This will transform you.